I'm here with Kenyon Farrow of thebody.com and a few days ago I got an email from Kenyon saying, let me talk about what's going on with respect to COVID-19, the coronavirus. So, mission accomplished. Kenyon, welcome back. Thank you, glad to be here. You've been following this closely. This is mm -hmm. part of your business. It's also part of your life. Yes. Um, what are you thinking? I think that one of the problems right now is that we're not getting the kind of uh, accurate information from the federal government or from our like local and state officials about the severity of what's happening. So therefore, the inertia to kind of put the public health sort of uh, controls in place uh, to kind of wait out the window period so that people could um, you know, not be transmitting the virus. We don't have enough tests. Uh, and so we don't have these things in place. And so therefore, there's kind of a, a mix of panic and a kind of, you know, people kind of not really understanding what's going on. And so therefore not maybe taking some of these measures seriously. So I think we have both a kind of an infrastructure problem, uh, political inertia, and then uh, the communication issue with in terms of telling the public what's really going on and what they can do. So two questions. The first, what is this revealing about our society? And then the second, what of all of this has echoes of the past and the experience that we all lived through of AIDS, HIV? And are there lessons from that period for this one? I think what it reveals about our society is that, um, and to sound very, you know, hippie about it, we're all very connected and we live in a more connected world uh, than ever. So the fact that there is no, uh, you know, borders in the sense that you can, you know, stop an infectious disease from spreading, right? So I think that that is one of the things. I mean, so even Donald Trump's wall, his putative wall, that will not protect wall us. will not protect us at all. Um, and actually, it, so it, it, it exposes that. It also exposes the lack of just infrastructure that we have to be able to take care of people. So the fact that we don't have uh, a single payer, a Medicare for all, where everybody has coverage if you are, you know, live in this country, um, so people could just get access to care. Um, we actually don't even have enough tests, right? In the, we're not testing enough people to make to find out who's who's sick. So it exposes some gaps there, um, and then also it exposes things like paid sick leave that we don't have federal laws for. Those things where people could stay home and not worry about not being able to, you know, meet bills if they had to had to in fact stay home. So I think just it exposed, I think, some of those real gaps that particularly in this election season, people really need to be t paying attention to the candidates they support at every level um, who are going to support these uh, kinds of initiatives. And I think because we haven't seen this kind of, uh, uh, of an epidemic or pandemic at this point in the United States in a long time, I think people have kind of forgotten how, you know, uh, terrible this can be. You know, so I, to me, I think those are some of the major lessons we have in, uh, to, to really learn. And echoes from the past, ex lessons from the past? I think there are some lessons, um, partly from the, the AIDS epidemic, but even going further back, um, you know, in terms of uh, the Spanish flu in 1918. Right? These you were not alive. Many, right? I was not alive, right? But, but in some ways, that is also slightly more analogous. But I, I think in terms of the AIDS epidemic, which people probably, you know, obviously have a, a more close memory of, ways in which it is similar is that we had a period where it was clear that an infectious disease was happening that was initially uh, blamed on a community. So initially, the fact that we called it gay-related immune defense, like what is a gay-related immune problem, right? That doesn't make any sense. But that was what it was called for, you know, some period of time, months or a year, until, you know, we realized it was human immunodeficiency virus, right, that was um, causing the illness and that people uh, did not have to be gay in order to, to contract it. Um, so I think we have like those lessons to learn. We also have the lessons to learn that um, governments actually have to tell the truth <laughs> and they have to tell the truth to people rapidly. And we just heard today, um, just before I got here, that uh, in another news outlet that um, apparently the White House officials have tried to uh, make all briefings about coronavirus to them from the other federal you know, agencies classified. So therefore, CDC director, 
HHS director, Tony Fauci at NIH, can't actually talk to the public or share, you know, what they're learning about how the virus is moving, how quickly, what else people need to know, new cases that may expose some other sorts of uh, groups at risk or whatever. Um, and so I think we're learning uh, that those lessons are kind of being repeated again if we remember the fact that Ronald Reagan did not want to talk about AIDS, in this case because of his own homophobia. Um, but, but government inaction can actually uh, make a, a problem spread even faster. The flip side of the AIDS story was that activism moved in and yes. we transformed the relationship of the patient to the expert, Yes, uh, flipped it in many circumstances. What's applicable from that experience, that side of the story? What's applicable about the kind of, you know, AIDS activism and the current situation is that um, people have to uh, empower themselves to learn about uh, you know, this epidemic um, where government is failing them, right? And people also have to demand that certain actions be taken. Um, and that is actually beginning to happen. And actually some of our noted AIDS activists are actually already moving um, in terms of their engaging both the city, the state, and the federal government about not moving fast enough in terms of alerting people to, you know, what the real dangers are. Um, and both for um, you know, people who may be at risk for contracting, but just for many of us who might contract but not actually get sick, we may still transmit it to people who do. And so not communicating those things. And also to think about people who are particularly vulnerable. So senior citizens, people who are homeless, um, people who uh, you know, otherwise don't have um, great social uh, support networks and who don't have necessarily access to certain kinds of care to really push for uh, infrastructure to be put in place so that um, everyone can be taken care of. And I think that um, it's, it's that piece of, of the activism that happened then uh, that is beginning to happen now and definitely needs to, to move forward. So interestingly, in an era of divide, 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 them and us, them, us, the virus is calling us to remember there's just an us. There's just an us. And that uh, if you think that, um, you know, th something couldn't happen to you or it's just those people over there, an infectious disease often uh, can remind us that uh, we are far more connected than we uh, sometimes want to think that we are and that investing in things that may support people who are more vulnerable than you are actually may benefit them and you.